Good morning, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to my, our presentation about Chapter 3, Evaluating Messages and Images of Different Types of Texts Reflecting Different Cultures as Used in the Educational Setting. By the way, I am Shilonia Moore and Daya Kinkito from the College of Teacher Education, taking up Bachelor of Secondary Education, Major in Sciences. This topic, or Chapter 3, is actually quite long, so to make it understandable as possible, we have decided to divide this topic into different parts and which will be discussed by my co-reporters. So, I would like to introduce to you the first topic, which is I am assigned to present, which is about media message and the four main qualities of an effective message. So now let us start with media message. So media message, these actually contain information and ideas that are shared to a large audience of people. Say, for example, we have our social medias. So that is one way of actually sharing um, a media message. So if these messages are not scrutinized properly, when we say scrutinized, not evaluated or examined thoroughly, they may, um, these messages could be come agents of misinformation and lead people from a very wrong judgment. So meaning to say that if the messages that we sent or are sent online or via media or, or social media are not thoroughly um, examined, this could become um, a challenge or a problem, most especially to those people who are fond of using social media. So by critically evaluating media message, we ensure that the ideas being presented are accurate, relevant, and appropriate to be posted or shared with everyone. So now let us proceed with why do we evaluate these messages? Well, um, the importance of evaluating the effectiveness of message is by developing and using strategies or strategic questions to identify a person's strengths and weaknesses. It also reduces uncertainties and improves effectiveness and enhances our decision making. Also, we evaluate um, messages. It is because it is required for us to create effective communication and better understanding for everyone. So now let us proceed with the strategies for evaluating a message. So how do we evaluate a message? Well, in order for us to evaluate whether a message is effective or not, we can ask ourselves a series of questions to reflect whether the messages have simplicity, specificity, structure, and stickiness. So these are actually the four main qualities of um, effective message. Again, we have simplicity, specificity, structure, and stickiness. First, let's start with simplicity. Simplicity, it means that for the message to have simplicity, we have to ask ourselves two sets of questions. The first question is, what is the purpose or what is the purpose of the ev evidence? And the second one is the core message being presented clear. So in simple definition, when we say simplicity, it means or it involves clear and evident explanation. So the purpose of message will be either to inform to persuade or to entertain. Knowing the purpose will guide us in the choice of information to include and its organization. A core message must have a clear and simple focus, one strategy to ensure clarity and simplicity um, to express the core message in a single sentence. So it is very important for us to be um, simple or to have this what we call brief and concise message whenever we try to give a message most especially for us teachers when we try to explain something to our students let us make sure not to add too many flowery words with what we're explaining and go directly to the point or go to a simple or simpler definition in which our students will be able to understand us much better next we proceed with specificity it refers to the choice of language. So there are actually questions that we have to ask ourselves whether or not the message we are um, trying to relay is has specificity. 
first one is the language specific and the second one the, is the language con concrete rather than abstract and then the third one we have does it use words which have additional meaning meaning and could perhaps be misconstructed so in simple definition specificity it refers to the choice of language we use no so in here and in specificity we should ensure that the language is specific as possible if you mean to um, for say for example if you mean to say poodle avoid saying the word dog because dog there's actually a lot of dog breeds and poodle is actually a single dog breed so language should be concrete or so um concrete so our readers or listeners can actually um, can vividly picture out the ideas that we are trying to translate so that it will become memorable images for them. So say for example in teaching, so we should have just avoid languages that are far beyond what we are trying to explain and just go with what we are trying or what we are um, focusing on. So that's it. So you might be wondering that simplicity and specific Specificity have something in common. Well, comparing both simplicity and specificity, um, specific, um, we can see that specificity focuses more on the language used when relaying the message. So, on to the next slide, we have structure. So, structure, these are ideas which should be organized and easy to follow. So, by asking us, I, we should ask ourselves this question. Do the message have a certain structure? So in simple definition, structure refers to how ideas should be logically organized and easy to follow. So the purpose of the message is to follow a certain path regardless of the information presented. It is important for us um, to consider that when we, we try to relay or when relaying our message, we should follow a certain path in um, such as we should follow a certain path that is organized and easy to follow for our readers or listeners. Last thing I would like to mention is the stickiness. So the stickiness is the fourth, the fourth one of the main qualities an effective message, which means that the message should display coherent and unity of ideas. It aims to answer or we have to answer this question when we try to identify stickiness, which is does the idea of the message flow smoothly so stickiness in here which is essentially how memorable your presentation or information is meaning to say that the ideas presented in your message must not must not consist a lot of jargons or flowery words and thus uh, it must be straight to the point before I end, I would like to emphasize the importance of evaluating a message and how, um, and how it could greatly affect or actually improve the effective, effectiveness of your communication and help you better to engage with your audience and it can also help you to allocate your resources and responses better. Before I end, I would like to emphasize the importance of evaluating a message and how, um, and how it could greatly affect or actually improve the effective, effectiveness of your communication and help you better to engage with your audience and it can also help you to allocate your resources and responses better. So in the future, be conscious about what you say or do as it could have significant impacts to the person you are relaying your message you are, relaying, re, you are relaying your message too. It was a pleasure being here with all of you today. I would like to give the floor now to our next presenter. The next subtopic is evaluating images. It is important to critically evaluate images you use for research. Study and presentation images should be evaluated like any other source, such as journal articles or books, to determine their quality, reliability, and appropriateness. Visual analysis is an important step in evaluating an image and understanding its meaning. There are three steps of evaluating an image. The first step is identifying source. When you use or search for an image that you want to go with your presentation, you have 
to pick a source that is reliable and trustworthy. The second step is interpret contextual information. Before choosing the image that goes with your presentation, you have to know what the events that were inspired behind the scenes of when the image was taken so that you know the actual context of the image and not give your audience a misleading or a wrong information about your presentation or discussion just because the image you use is not aligned with the topic. The third and last step in evaluating an image is understand implications. Sometimes there are hidden messages that are conveyed in an image and the audience would probably throw questions at you as the presenter. So you have to be ready to answer those questions with relevant and factual information that is aligned to your topic of discussion. In analyzing the text or images, there are questions that you have to ask yourself as a researcher before you proceed in choosing the image that goes with your presentation. The first type of analysis is content analysis. The questions are as follows. What do you see? What is the image all about? Are there people in the image? What are they doing? How are they presented? Can the image be looked at in different ways? And lastly, how effective is the image as a visual message? After answering these questions, you are able to see to it that the content of your image is aligned or relevant to the topic of or theme of your discussion. You're also able to make sure that the images are factual and are not misleading. The, th the second type of analysis is visual analysis. The questions are as follows. How is the image composed? What is in the background and what is in the foreground? And last, what are the most important visual? In an image, there are elements that are highlighted and there are elements that serve only as the background of the key element to further emphasize the meaning that the image wants to convey. The last type of analysis is image source. The questions are as follows. Where did you find the image? What information does the source provide about the origins of the image? Is the source reliable and trustworthy? And last, was the image found in an image database or was it being used in another context to convey meaning? As a researcher, you have to make sure that your image that is presented is factual and reliable and comes from a source that is trustworthy and telling you the factual information rather than mislead you and tell you things that are not true. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, classmates. I welcome you to my presentation in continuation of the first reporter. I am Jennifer E. Fernandez from College of Teacher Education, Norsu Main Campus 1. I am here today to talk to you about technical quality, contextual info, and additional tips in evaluating images. First, let us talk about technical quality. It is where the quality of the image will be evaluated. Is the image large enough to suit your purpose? Is the image appropriate and useful to your purpose? Is the color, light, and balance true? Does the image contain appropriate colors to the picture shown? Is the brightness and balance of colors okay and well blended? Is the image a quality digital image without pixelation or distortion? Does the image have a good quality and not blurry? Will others be able to identify the images? Is the image in a file format you can use? Will the image be helpful and accessible for you to use? Next is contextual info. It means information about the structure, content, and context of a document providing necessary and adequate conditions to ensure the authenticity and accessibility of a document. We may ask the questions, 
what information accompanies the image? Is it related to the image and thus the information about the image? Does the text change how you see the image? How? Does the information relate to the image and does the text align to the image? Is the textual information intended to be factual, uninformed, or is intended to influence what and how you see? What kind of context does the information provide? Is the information informative? Does it answer the questions where, how, and why? To evaluate messages and images of different types of text reflecting different culture, the following should be done. First, understand how the specified cultures live. Second, how the people in the specified group communicate with each other. What are their language and ways of communication? Third, learn the symbolism of their culture. Fourth, be aware in every detail such as artifacts, language, and symbolism. Fifth, get the meanings being addressed by the images. Understand images as it contains meaning. Sixth, get the important elements conveyed by the images. Seventh, getting the audience for the images. And additional tips in evaluating messages. First, get the meanings being addressed by the images. We have to understand the meaning of the images that it wanted to convey and do not just look at the outer meaning but also the deeper meaning of it. And second, get the important elements conveyed by the image, its form, color, size, meaning, etc. In conclusion, I can say that it is very important for us future educators to evaluate the materials that we would use, like the images that we will use in our presentations. If the image is of good quality and the information it contains is relevant and aligned with the images. Good day everyone. I am Lumen Limkis, a student of Negros Oriental State University taking up Bachelor of Secondary Education major in Filipino. And today, we are now proceeding to the third tips in evaluating images. So the third tips is getting the audience for the images. So why is it important to identify the audience of images? Understanding the intended audience for the images is crucial for evaluating them. We must consider who the images are intended for and why. For example, an image of a family celebrating a holiday might be intended for a holiday greeting cards for family and friends. The interaction between nonverbal and verbal forms of communication more in particular, the relationship between visual symbols other than writing and the recording of speech in writing are important for the evaluation of both images and text. This quote highlights the ways in which nonverbal communication, such as images, can interact with verbal communication, such as text, to convey meaning and information. The evaluation of images and text can benefit from a consideration of this relationship. When evaluating Im images, it's important to consider not only the visual elements of the images, but also any accompanying text if present. For example, if an image is accompanied by text, pay attention to how the text and the image work together to convey information or tell a story. According to some, medieval images may be read. This view is based on the assumption that just as texts convey meaning and ideas, so do images. This perspective often emphasizes the symbolic and allegorical aspects of medi medieval images which were intended to convey deeper meanings and messages beyond their surface appearance. On the other hand, the perception of images is fundamentally different from that of text. They highlight 
the importance of the visual and emotional aspects of images as well as their ability to evoke subconscious responses and feeling that make them distinct from written language. This view emphasizes the unique qualities of images such as their ability to convey complex information and ideas through the use of color, composition, and other visual elements. Both perspectives offer valuable insights into the ways in which medieval images can be interpreted and understood. However, they also highlight the different ways in which people may perceive and respond to images. Now, I have here nine questions. So, number one, do images have morphology, a syntax and semantics of their own? Yes. Images have morphology, which refers to the visual characteristics that make up the image, such as colors, lines, and planes. Images also have a syntax, which refers to the logical relationships between the different components of the image, such as the placement of objects and the direction of lines. Additionally, images have meanings and messages conveyed by the image such as symbols and connotation. 2. In other words, do both texts and images have a grammar? Is it useful to speak of visual literacy? Yes, both texts and images have a grammar, which refers to the rules and convention that, con that govern the construction and interpreta interpretation of visual images and texts. It is useful to speak of visual literacy as it refers to the ability to understand and interpret visual images just as the term literacy that refers to the ability to read and write. 3. Can text be considered as images? No. Text and images are fundamentally different forms of representation. Text rely on language to convey meaning while images rely on visual information. However, text and images can be used together to create a more comprehensive message. Number four, how are text and images perceived? Text and images are perceived differently. Texts are processed by the left side of the brain, which is responsible for language and analytical thinking while images are processed by the right side of the brain, which is responsible for spatial thinking and emotional processing. Both texts and images can convey different kinds of information, so they are useful in different contexts and for different purposes. 5. Do they communicate different kinds of messages? Yes. Texts and images communicate different kinds of messages. We all know that text can convey information more precisely and in greater depth than images, while images can convey emotions and feelings that are more difficult to put into words. Therefore, text and images are best used together with text providing the necessary details and images adding emotional depth and texture. 6. Can an image's message be put into words? Yes, an image's message can be put into words, but it may not capture the full essence of the image. Images are more than just words and are better of conveying emotions, feelings, and moods than words alone. Therefore, while words can explain an image's meaning, they may not do it justice. 7. In which social context does medieval man prefer the visual to the textual? During the Middle Ages, the main form of communication was oral. People communicated stories and legend through songs, poetry, storytelling, and all of which were forms of art. Visual art was important in the Middle Ages, especially in religious contexts. However, the preference for visual art over textual art was not as strong as it is today, especially because written texts were still used in religious ceremonies and for administrative purposes. 8. What about the interplay of texts and images? 
There is a strong interplay between texts and images in rituals and ceremonies, especially in religious contexts. Texts and images both play an important role in conveying the meaning and significance of rituals and ceremonies. In religious contexts, texts are often accompanied by images such as an icon and stained glass windows. Images can enhance the impact of text by providing visual representation and symbolism. Lastly, nine, do we observe an evolution in our perception of images due to the development of a literate mentality? Yes, the development of a literate mentality has led to an evolution in the perception of images. With the rise of literacy, texts and written words became the dominant form of communication as a result, the importance of images declined and they become seen as a secondary form of expression. And now, let's proceed to the next topic, which is all about cultural text. So, what comes into your mind when you hear the word cultural text? So, a cultural text is anything that communicates significant meaning within a particular culture. It includes objects actions, and behavior that reveal cultural meanings. Food and clothing are two examples of cultural texts that suggest cultural information, but the scope of cultural texts extend far beyond just this example. The entire place and space, all of the people and interaction, all of the rituals and rules, and the various forms in which they manifest themselves are all readable texts suitable for observation and analysis by the ethnographer and writer. Cultural texts are valuable sources of information about the meaning, values, and beliefs of a particular culture. <clears throat> so we always remember that cultural texts can be studied across a wide range of disciplines including anthropology, sociology, literature, and history. By examining cultural texts, we can gain insight into the ways in which different cultures express themselves and how their meanings and values are derived. So that would be my part. I will give the floor to the next reporter. That would be all. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Leslie F. Herodias from Negros Oriental State University, taking the Bachelor of Secondary Education major in Sciences. And now, let's tackle on the sample identification of a cultural text. Take a look around the room or place you are in right now, and briefly catalog the people and or things you see. These objects and actions are cultural text. In traditional American college classroom, there are some cultural texts that are fairly standard, like tables, and chairs or disc, bright lightning like black or white board to write on. Your classroom may also be a smart room where it has complete with computer or LCD projector. There may be windows, one or two doors. The floor may or not be not be I mean not be carpeted. There will also be the presence of decoration, paint, tiles, or etc. A space may or not be void of people who are also considered to be cultural text. Their actions, arrangements, and demographic reflect how the space is used. What is in a space and what happens in the space are all cultural texts that are available for analysis. In other words, the space and objects within it are readable cultural text. They say something about purpose, needs, and perhaps even values and beliefs of the people who occupy it. And now let's proceed on the identification of cultural text will be absolutely necessary, but they are fairly easy to identify once you get the hang of it. If your classroom is traditional, there will be places for people to sit and surfaces in, on which to write. 
What we may not all share is the form of these seats and surfaces and the formation of these seats in the room. Look around and take note. Are there individual desks or tables or chairs? Can you move seats into different, arran into different arrangements? Are there computers? How are the desks arranged? Where do the students sit? Where does the instructor, instructor sit or stand? And that is why classroom structure cannot be overstated. In the realm of education, it provides the framework for effective teaching and learning by promoting organization, discipline, and a conducive atmosphere. An efficiently structured classroom supports the, supports the safety of students, caters to di deserve, diverse rather, needs, and enables dynamic teacher-student interactions, fostering an environment where students can engage, colla engage collaborate, and, and thrive academically. Good day everyone, I am David Paul Dorimon from Bachelor of Secondary Education major in Sciences. Analysis can be challenging because we have all agreed to the meaning which we take them for granted. For example, it's most likely that you have never entered a classroom and been all that confused about where you should sit or what part of the space is intended for the instructor. It is also most probably true that whether the classroom desks are arranged in rows or in a circle, students will always leave the front of the room for the instructor and arrange themselves at a distance from the instructor. There is an invisible buffer zone around the teacher space that students seem to acknowledge, yet it is not something they discuss and agree on before they enter the room. These things speak to the strong message of hierarchy and authority set through the way the furniture is organized in the classroom space and how well it connects to the students' existing beliefs about the positions they and their teachers occupy in that space. This last larger observation, then, one that goes beyond the mere description of what happens to suggest a reason why this is how and why certain behavior occurs, is a starting point for cultural analysis. The analysis continues as you work to ask even more questions as follows. First is that, are there any works of art or books or media that provide insight into the values and ideas of the people there? How do your classmates or other people around you present themselves through their clothing? What messages are you reading from them? How might they be reading you? These types of questions are really just the beginning as you identify the variety of cultural texts available to you in your research. Good day everyone, my name is Marjorie D. Limbre from Neveros Oriental State University Campus 1 from the College of Teacher Education this at Philippine. So now we are going to tackle about uh, detecting bias in the social, in the media. We'll go beyond the subtopics we are, we are, uh, which are media bias, bias in omission, bias by emphasis, and so on. Now let's start by the detecting bias in the media. When we say detecting bias, what comes to your mind? Alright, so detecting bias is ubiquitous or everywhere and not easy to detect. It is always useful to prepare several sources of information and in doing so, it becomes clear that media coverage is never completely objective. So, and, and when we say bias, what comes to your mind? Yes, when we say bias, it is a statement reflect a Partiality, preference, or prejudice for uh, for or against a person, object, or idea. Also, some media bias tend to spread uh, spread negativity rather than accurate one. We should use media for positive outcome. 
And next is the bias in omission. What is bias omission? Bias omission is the tendency to judge harmful action or commission as worse or less moral than equally harmful insurrection or omission. And bias by emphasis. Bias by emphasis is the story or the on the front page or at the top of the hour hour which stories which stories that get the largest headlines or the first and longest coverage on your tv or radio consider how this place influences people's sin, uh, sense of what is important and Next is, let's proceed the uh, bias by use of language. The use of labels such as terror, terrorist, revolutionary, or freedom fighter can, you, uh, can create completely different impressions of the same person or event. For instance, we often see uh, media news, news with logos making people understand their their perspective and that is part of bias by use of language because it greatly changes and impact the insight of people next is bias in photos so unflattering pictures can create bad impressions and partial pictures of senses can completely change and con uh, change the context of an event then so if you notice some pictures are not totally posted that causes different and change the uh, different and change the exact idea of what is really meant and the last one is the bias in the source so article about a cure for cancer written by a drug company is not the same as an article by the by an independent researcher so often private companies government public relation firms and political groups produce uh, produce press releases to gain media exposure and to influence the public so it is very understandable that sometimes even if the sources was accurate and reliable if there is no such power including being well uh, being well known and having a lot of backups can still be able to forgotten hi this is malwa ismail from nagros oriental state university main campus one and i took up bachelor of secondary education major in filipino so now i am assigned to tackle about different kinds of topics of biases including bias by headlines bias by repetition bias in numbers and statistics bias in diversity as well as bias from the point of view so now let's get started first of all if you hear the word bias what comes into your mind all right so bias is the unfair treatment towards any of the following including the people the society and anything that happens in our world so that is what we call bias so now what is bias by headlines so some headlines can be deceptive as their main purpose is to grab attention so many people read only the headlines which can create a distorted sense of what is really going on or turn a non-event into a, into a sensational event so one example I can give about this bias is when we read a newspaper, we can see the top headlines or the top title itself. That is what we call bias by headlines. So even if you did not read the full coverage of the news or in the media, you can actually have or get some insights into what is it all about. Next, bias by repetition. So the repetition of a particular event or idea can lead people to believe that it is true. So very widespread and much more important than it really is. 
So bias by repetition, even if it is not that very important to someone, if you repeatedly post it, if you repeatedly put it on media, and also if you repeatedly put it on news, it can actually give insights and idea of people that it is very important and that it should be put in a particular event. So that is part of bias by repetition. Next, bias in numbers and statistics. So statistics needs to be interpreted. They are often used to create false impressions of the following statement, which, the, uh, which statistics would you use to try to convince someone that, that that penalty is a good idea? All right, so some of you might think that that penalty is good, but somehow others might think that it is not. So under this, almost 30% of those surveyed support the death penalty. However, more than 70% of those surveyed are against the death penalty. So if we think it critically, we can say that it is kind of biased because there is an unfair treatment or unfair percentage of what is happening to what people think. So since 70% of those surveyed are against the death penalty, it is somehow concluded that that penalty is not good to everyone. Okay, now let's proceed. Bias in diversity. When we say diversity, what really comes into your mind? All right, so bias, when we say diversity, these are the differences between the race, the culture, the traditions and beliefs. So what is bias in diversity? So bias in diversity is what is the race and gender diversity at the news outlet you watch compared to the communities it serves. So how many producers, editors, or decision makers at news outlets are women, people of color, or openly gay or lesbian in order to fairly represent different communities? So new outlets should have members of those communities in decision-making position. So one example I can give in this bias of diversity is that if we watch some news specifically to international news, we can see um, a bias in the color or the racist one. A lot of information, a lot of news happening in social medias that are going to discriminate those black ones rather than those white peoples. So that is part of bias in diversity because there is no fair treatment between what um, that person comes from. Okay, now let's, we'll be tackled more deeply into the last topic, which is bias from the point of view. So political coverage often focuses on how issues affect politicians or corporate executives rather than those directly affected by the issue. So for example, Many stories and parental notification of abortion emphasize the tough choice, confronting male politicians while quoting no women under 18, those with the most of stick in the debate. Also, economic coverage usually looks at how events impact stakeholders rather than workers or consumers. Lastly, demand that those affected by the issue have a voice in coverage. So under this bias from the point of view is that um, I can give an example is those platforms that we have usually see in social medias, in any kind of networking medias, that they are going to approach, they are going to emphasize their point of view or their beliefs so that people might think and people will believe to them. So. If I can give further example, I can see that some news specifically, they don't put any name just to put it unknown so that people would not, um, would not believe or would not see any negativity towards that specific politician that they are with. I am Maria Salome G. Gamboa a fourth year student currently taking up Bachelor of Secondary Education major in Science. Now, let's proceed to the next topic, which is a five different types of text. So these are the narrative, descriptive, directive, expository, and argumentative. So let's begin. So what is narrative as you can see here in the powerpoint the definition of a narrative text so 
Um, a narrative text it, it tells a story and often have a like a characters, a plot, and a setting. So, in an educational context, these texts can be used to to engage student in a storytelling and like creative, uh, like creative writing, right? So, for example, is that reading a short story to to our student and discussing the plot the characters and themes to to improve their comprehension and like creative thinking the next one is the descriptive text so when we say descriptive text it provide detailed descriptive from the word descriptive text it provide detailed information about a subject, person, place, or a thing. They, um, they help students to develop their ability to, to describe and paint a picture with words. For example, of descriptive text is like reading a passage describing a historical landmarks or um scientific concept in details encouraging like encouraging students to visualize and discuss it the third one is the directive text so when we say directive text um it applies direction or issued for other like um directive text it give a clear instruction or command so they are like they are essential for teaching to our student on how to follow direction and perform tasks accurately so for example for this is the providing um like providing step by step instruction for our science experiment or a math problem so that's one of our basic um, example so having a student to follow like let our student to follow those um, process in order to to uh, like those direction and to like after that the we the teacher discuss about the result that's a descriptive so now the fourth one is the expository text so when we say expository text um aims to to inform and explain a topic or a concept so they are commonly used in textbook or to impart knowledge and facts so example for this is um, like using a section from history or a science textbook to explain a complex historical event or scientific like scientific theory and discussing it in a lecture the last one is what argumentative so when we say argument it argumentative defined as a type of discourse concerned with a presentation so argumentative is it is a text that present a clear argument and support it with evidence and reasoning so like this text is help the student to develop critical and debate skills so critical thinking and debate skills i mean so for example is that sharing an article or essay uh, that present an arguments for against a current social issue then leading a discussion with student on the topic and encouraging them to form their own opinion so by using those five different types of a text um and corresponding like correspond those examples and discussion with student or our student we can enhance or we can help or we can enhance their reading comprehension writing critical thinking uh, making educational content engaging and informative so thank you everyone and have a good day.